Ooh, exciting. It is. Especially with this paper you sent over. Oh, yeah. By Fama and French, no less. The legends. Dissecting anomalies. We're going to help you understand those weird patterns in stock returns. The ones that... The ones that, like, don't make sense. Yes. Yeah. Like, they should not exist if everything we thought we knew about finance was true. Right. Exactly. Like, it really highlights where our current theories, you know... They break down. They totally break down. Like, it makes us question everything. It's so cool. So before we get into all that good stuff, let's just make sure yeah. we're on the same page here. Can you give us, like, a quick and dirty definition of what anomalies are? And, like, why should we even care? Yeah, totally. So anomalies... They're basically patterns in stock returns that uh, they just can't be explained by those traditional financial models. Like CPM. Yeah, CPM, right. the capital asset pricing model. Right, right. So these patterns, they shouldn't exist, but they do. They're like right there in our faces. Exactly. And Fama and French, they walk us through a whole bunch of them. Oh, yeah. Size, value, profitability, growth accruals, net stock issues, momentum. Okay, there's a lot. A lot. And and each one could mean that like what we think we know about the market is is wrong. Or at least incomplete. Yeah. Which is kind of exciting. Totally. It's like a puzzle. Right. Thank you for tuning in to Quantopian's Quant Radio, your AI driven podcast exploring everything related to quantitative finance. If you enjoy this episode, don't forget to like and subscribe to stay updated on future releases. For more quant-focused content, join us at community.quantopian.com. There you can explore a wealth of resources, connect with fellow quants, engage in insightful discussions, and enhance your skills through our extensive range of online courses. Quant Radio is intended to help people develop their knowledge and skills in quant finance. This podcast is not intended to provide investment advice. And now, back to the episode. Okay, well, let's rewind for a second, talk about one of the most famous anomalies. Okay. The size effect. Yeah. So Fama and French found that this size effect, the fact that smaller companies tend to have higher returns, uh -huh. it's mainly driven by micro caps. The micro caps. Okay. Yeah. And, and just to be clear, micro caps, those are companies with um, market caps. Like their total value. Yeah. Total value of all their shares below the 20th percentile of the NYSE. Okay. So we're not just talking about small companies. We're talking like... It's the tiniest. Yeah. And and the effect kind of weakens as you start looking at larger companies. Hmm. Interesting. So does that mean we should all run out and buy micro caps? Well, not so fast. There's a couple things to consider. Um, while they may have higher returns, <laughs> they also come with their own challenges, right? They can be illiquid, meaning it's hard to buy and sell large amounts without like really moving the price. Right. And then transaction costs can eat into your profits too. High risk, high reward. Pretty much. Okay. So how did Fama and French uncover all these anomalies? Like what, what do they even do? They used two main methods, uh, sorts and, uh, cross-sectional regressions. Okay, but break those down for me. Okay, so sorts, that's where they group stocks based on um, certain characteristics, right? Okay. Like high profitability versus low profitability and then compared their average returns. So it's like, I don't know, it's like organizing your bookshelf by genre and then you're like, oh, I really like mysteries. And then um, the cross-sectional regression, that's basically, um, it's a statistical model to like figure out the relationship between those specific characteristics and stock returns. Like controlling for all these different variables. Exactly. Like right. trying to figure out how sugar affects your mood uh -huh. while also considering like how much sleep you got and whether you went to the gym. Yeah. So you can really isolate the effect of sugar. Exactly. That's what they did with these anomalies. Cool. So out of all the anomalies that they looked at, were there any that really stood out? Yeah, definitely. Net stock issues was a big one. Basically, companies issuing a ton of new stock, okay. they tend to underperform hmm. while those buying back their stock share repurchases. Mm -hmm. They often see higher returns, assuming all else is equal. So it's not just about the size of the company. It's what they're doing. Yeah. And, and get this, this pattern held true regardless of the company size. That's really interesting. Any other like all-star anomalies? Yeah, actually. One you're probably familiar with. Momentum. Ah, momentum. So that's the idea that winning stocks. They keep winning. But that kind of goes against like the whole efficient market thing, right? Right. You'd think that in a truly efficient market, these anomalies would just like disappear. As soon as investors figure them out. Exactly. So what's going on? Like, are there opportunities for savvy investors? Or is there just like hidden risk we don't know about? That's the question. And that's what makes this whole area of research so fascinating. Right? Totally. 
So it wasn't all just superstars. No, not all anomalies were created equal. Some were weaker or less consistent. Like the underdogs. Like accruals, high accruals, those are like non-cash accounting items. Okay. They're generally linked to lower future returns, but uh, the relationship wasn't as clear for bigger companies. Interesting. And then there's asset growth. So growing your assets really quickly, that didn't really predict good or bad returns. For big companies. For big companies, but there was a bit of a negative link for smaller companies. So it's not a clear signal? No, not always. What about profitability? You'd think that would be a pretty good predictor, right? You would think so. But uh, while companies with uh, high profitability, especially smaller ones, tend to have better returns, uh -huh. the study didn't find a consistent relationship between unprofitability and lower returns. Huh. That's weird. Yeah, it is. So what does it all mean? Is the market just chaos? Are all our fancy models useless? Not necessarily. We need to remember that um, this is just one study. Right. And the findings... They might not hold true everywhere or, you know, forever. Plus, they used historical data. And uh, as you know, past performance doesn't always predict the future. Right. So um, while Fama and French's study shows these interesting relationships, mm -hmm. it doesn't definitively prove whether they're due to, like, mispricing. Like investors just getting it wrong. Yeah. yeah. Or, um, or some, like, rational risk factors that we just haven't discovered yet. So maybe there's more to it than we can see right now. Exactly. And to understand this a bit better... We need to bring in a really crucial concept. Okay. The valuation equation. Ooh, I like the sound of that. Right. So the valuation equation suggests that higher expected net cash flows, and that means like earnings minus investments, all relative to book value, nope. they should lead to higher expected returns, assuming everything else stays the same. Okay. So how do we connect that back to these anomalies? Well, think of the anomalies as like, clues about those future cash flows companies buying back their stock they probably have a lot of cash right that signals strong net cash flow high momentum stocks might be signaling higher expected earnings in the future and then on the other hand right. companies with high accruals could be investing a lot relative to their earnings exactly and that could impact their future cash flow so these anomalies they might be reflecting expectations about future cash flow. Right. But are those expectations accurate or are they like totally wrong? Hmm. Good question. Man, we've covered a lot of ground in this first part. We've laid out like the basics, explored these crazy anomalies, but now we need to tackle the big question. Yeah. What does all this mean for, you know, us, no. for investors? Like, can we actually use these insights? That's the goal, right. But remember, it's not as simple as just like blindly following them. Right. No get rich quick schemes. Haha, uh -huh, exactly. We talked about the limitations, like past performance isn't everything, and just because two things are related doesn't mean No so. one caused the other. Right. Correlation, not causation. A big difference. Yeah. Huge. But still, we shouldn't ignore them. <laughs> Definitely not. Think of them like clues. Oh, clues. I like that. Yeah. Not like a treasure map, more like a starting point. Okay. So they can point us in the right direction. Maybe help us see things we might miss otherwise. Okay, let's put on our detective hats and go back to those companies issuing a lot of new stock. Oh, yeah. Fama and French said they tend to underperform. Why is that? Well, one possibility is um, they're trying to cash in. Ooh, like when the stock is high. Exactly. Like maybe they know something investors don't. Like when you try to sell your old car before. Before it breaks down completely. Uh-huh, yeah. Okay, so that's one possibility. What else? Another is um, they might be using the money for a really risky project. That investors aren't so sure about. Exactly. So it's kind of red flag. Yeah. You want to be careful there. What about when companies buy back their stock? Share repurchases. Right. Well, that could actually signal the opposite, that they think their stock is undervalued. Oh, so they're like, we're so confident we're buying our own stock. Yeah. Putting their money where their mouth is. And investors like to see that. They do. Okay. Now, what about momentum? Why do those winning stocks keep winning? and the losers keep losing. Momentum is tricky. There's no like one answer everyone agrees on. Some think it's about behavioral biases, like investors jumping on the bandwagon, you know? Oh yeah, totally. Or being slow to react to bad news. It's like you're at a concert, everyone's jumping up and down. And you just can't help but join in. Yeah, even if you don't even know the song. Exactly. Okay, so that's one idea. What else? Well, there are also risk-based explanations, like maybe momentum reflects new information coming out gradually. So the market is just catching up. Right. Or maybe the risk of the stock itself is changing. So the price keeps moving in that direction. Yeah, it's probably a mix of both. Okay. Momentum is complicated. It really is. Let's talk about accruals and asset growth. 
break those down for me. So accruals, remember, those are non-cash accounting items, and they can like distort the picture of a company's earnings. Okay. So if a company has high accruals, it might be a sign they're playing games with their accounting. Can make things look better than they are. Exactly. Like putting on a lot of makeup to hide the blemishes. Uh -huh, perfect analogy. So investors are wary of high accruals. Yeah, because it raises questions about... Like, are those earnings real? Right, right. What about growing too fast? Yeah, why would that be a bad thing? Well, imagine trying to drink from a fire hose. Whoa, too much. Right. It can be overwhelming. When a company grows too fast, it can strain their resources, you know. Okay, so sometimes bigger isn't better. Not always. And another reason to be careful is acquisitions. Companies on a growth spree, they often make a lot of acquisitions. And those can be risky. Very risky. They don't always work out the way they planned. So many things can go wrong. Oh, yeah. Clashing cultures, overpaying mm -hmm. for the target. Right, right. Okay, so we've talked about these anomalies, but before we go any further, yeah, what are some of the limitations of Fama and French's research? What should we keep in mind? Well, it's important to remember this is just one study, and the findings might not apply everywhere or at all times. Right. We can't just assume it's a universal truth. Exactly. Plus... They used historical data. And past performance. Doesn't guarantee future results. Right, right. Anything else? The study doesn't definitively prove cause and effect. Just because we see a connection. Doesn't mean one thing caused the other. Right. And finally, the world of finance is always changing. Oh, yeah, for sure. New anomalies might appear. Old ones might disappear. So we got to stay flexible. Right. Okay. So we've laid the groundwork, explored the anomalies, talked about the limitations. Now, the big question. Yeah. What does it all mean for investors? How can we use this knowledge to make smarter investment decisions? That's the key question, right? Can we turn these insights into like real strategies for investors? Remember, it's not about blindly following the anomalies. Right. No magic formula. Uh-huh. No. But we shouldn't dismiss them either. Yeah. They can be valuable tools, you know. Help us see opportunities and risks that we might miss otherwise. So it's more about using them as a starting point. Exactly. Like, let's say you're looking at a company issuing a lot of new stock. Uh -huh. Fama and French's research suggests we should pause there and ask some questions. Like, why are they doing that? Right. Are they trying to, like, take advantage of a high stock price? Oh, interesting. Or maybe they're funding a risky project. That investors are worried about? Yeah. So it's a signal to be careful. Do your homework. Exactly. Same thing with high accruals. Right. We talked about that. Dig deeper. See if they're using like aggressive accounting. Like hiding the problems. Yeah. Okay. But what about the, the good anomalies? Like momentum, profitability. Right. Those can help you find companies with, you know, potential. But again, we can't just blindly follow them. No, we need to be smart about it. Do our research. Exactly. And remember, investing is all about balancing risk and reward. And anomalies can help us do that. They can, but they're just one piece of the puzzle. Right. We need to think about our own goals, our risk tolerance, all that stuff. Exactly. It's about being a thoughtful investor. Making informed decisions. Yeah. Based on like a full picture of the market. Not just chasing the latest trend. Exactly. This has been such an eye-opening deep dive. We've gone from like the theory behind these anomalies to like how we can actually use them. Yeah, it's been a journey. We've explored Fama and French's work, yeah. talked about the limitations, and hopefully, you know, learned some valuable lessons along the way. Absolutely. But as we wrap up, I want to leave you with one final thought. If these anomalies can't be fully explained by our current models, what does that tell us about how markets really work? Hmm. Are we seeing mispricing or is there something deeper going on? Ooh, that's a good one. Maybe there's a whole new theory of finance out there just waiting to be discovered. Right. One that can explain all these weird patterns. Maybe. The search for answers continues. And that's what makes finance so exciting. Totally. Keep exploring, keep questioning, and never stop learning. Couldn't have said it better myself. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive into market anomalies. Until next time, happy investing. <laughs>